Well, hello. I'm really pleased to be here again. Honored to have Hans's invitation to speak again. Um, most of you um, who have heard me speak know I usually speak on intellectual property. <laughs> That's about it. No, in libertarian legal topics. Um, I do have a, a PowerPoint today. I'm a little embarrassed, but David Durr assured me he has one too, so I won't be alone. Um, I can't help myself sometimes. I, I make notes for my speeches, and then I have to footnote or hyperlink. Uh, but later, I'll put this on my podcast, and I like to put the, the PowerPoint down because it has links to things we discuss here that I might not be able to get to or further reading uh, material. So um, most of you who know me or know of me know of me through libertarian matters, but um, I have written and spoken on some purely legal matters, a reasonable amount in my career, uh, mostly on intellectual property law, not the policy aspect, but law itself, and even oil and gas law, I used to do that, and uh, international law, and even legal ethics. Um, and I have a whole other website, which is not, I don't recommend it, it's not exciting, but it's Kinsella Law, it's my, my lawyer website. And my name there is Norman, because uh, I'm hoping to prevent searches from finding uh, Stefan Kinsella showing potential employers what I write for libertarian matters. But um, I have long had an interest in, in law itself, uh, legal theory, comparative law, international law. Uh, and I think this has helped add to my interest in, in libertarian theory, but also independently, the legal theory has always interested me. So today, I wanted to speak about something I haven't spoken about before, just international law itself, and maybe with some libertarian insights to various aspects of it. Uh, I think one reason I've been interested in this is I did study law in Louisiana, which is the only civil law state in the United States. All the other 49 jurisdictions are common law based, English common law based. Louisiana has a civil law um, uh, legal system similar to what is present in most of uh, continental Europe. Um, but of course we had to learn the common law too, so I had an interest in comparative law. I even spoke here, uh, I wrote a long article for the JLS in 1995 on legislation and comparative law and I spoke on a related topic here in 2012. Um, and then I went to a master's degree in international law in London, so um, that enhanced my interest in international law, and I published on that too. I published a book in 2005 with Oxford on international business law, and the new edition's coming out um, uh, soon, very early next year, I think. Um, so. That explains my interest in this. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the first PFS was 2006, which Hans somewhat hastily called. It was, it was well done and nice, but my very first talk here, which is not recorded, but it was a panel discussion based upon that book that I wrote, and it was about international investment. So I, I actually did speak a little bit on this topic one time before, uh, and so did several other of the previous speakers who have been here for Remy Shimashius and Nikolai Gertchev and Josef Sima from Czech Republic, and Matt Mahai from Poland. Um, so I'm revisiting a topic, in a sense, from a long time ago. Um, for those who get a little interested in international law from my talk today, um, I will have a list of recommended reading at the end, but this is just a sample of some of the main books that I have read and relied upon. Um, sort of the Bible in international law is the Brownlee book, uh, Principles of Public International Law. Uh, and then there's Oppenheim, which is out of date now, but being updated. That's the, the old the comprehensive set. And uh, there's one by Mark Janis and one by Shaw. And those are both excellent um, and well updated and systematic and comprehensive. Uh, one of my professors at London School of Economics when I was in London is Rosalind Higgins, who was later a judge, a judge on the International Court of Justice and one of the world's leading international lawyers. Um, and she, she has a wonderful book. It's one of the favorite books I've ever read, actually. It's not comprehensive, but it's her personal view about international law, and I highly, highly recommend this book. It's called Problems and Process. So it's about international law. So anyone with an interest, you can follow up with, with that. Uh, some of the classic books, Hugh just on uh, The Law of War from 1625, Divitel, The Law of Nations, 1758. So this is sort of leading up to the history. I have an eclectic list of things that I find interesting that are related to comparative law, and I'll keep it on my, my blog, and you can look at it later. Um, now, so what is international law? So first you should know that um, international law is broken down into two basic types, public and private international law. Public international law is the, the body of law or rules that govern the relations among 
independent sovereign states in the world today. And there's roughly 200 states in the world. Now this is as opposed to what's called municipal law, which we all think of as our government's law. So the laws in Turkey or in the US or in, in England are called municipal law by international lawyers. It's the domestic law of a given state. Um, and when people talk about international law, they usually are referring to public international law. But there's a second body of rules called private international law, um, which really is about conflict of laws. So that has to do with interactions between four, uh, people of different countries, trade, and when there's a lawsuit or a dispute, and it's usually going to be in a court of one of the countries, which laws apply? Is it the law of the other country or this one, or some kind of special rule applied to them? So private international law has to do more with transactions and trade uh, between individuals. And uh, you can think of the distinction also, public international law, the subjects of the law are states, primarily, and some other international bodies. But primarily, states are the actors on the public international, international law uh, scene, whereas uh, private international law is how to, uh, how to handle disputes between corporations and private persons uh, with their interactions across borders. Okay, the history of international law. Um, in Roman times, there was something called ius gentium, the law of nations, which is not what we mean by the law of nations now. The word law of nations now is more or less synonymous with what we call international law. But back then, it, it basically meant the law that was common or universal to mankind, and the Romans could use the, those principles to apply, the, uh, to, apply to foreigners in, in Roman courts. And there was also ius uh, intergentes, that was the law between nations, sort of like treaties. So it was very primitive, it wasn't like our modern conception of international law. For that to happen, the conception of the state had to change, and it started changing in the 16th century when the state started being thought of as the modern sovereign or political state, um, as opposed to just being identified with the monarch, but it was identified with the personality of the nation itself, so the nation state arose. And when the, the concept, conception of the state started changing, um, um, thinkers started saying, well, the, this law of nations starts a, does apply to states themselves. They're bound by some kind of higher law between the states. And so Hugo Grotius in 1625 wrote about the laws of war, what are states' limits and obligations when they conduct war. Uh, and then the term uh, international law was actually introduced in 1789 by Jeremy Bentham, and it took, it took over, and now that is the term that we use. But it was called the law of nations pretty much before that. So now we refer to it as international law, okay? Um, you know, Montesquieu in 1748 had a formulation of what the modern state system was like, and it was offered to Napoleon in 1806 by Talleyrand, and it was the idea that nations ought to do to one another in peace the most good and in war, the least evil possible. It's one of these sort of principles of how states should get along with each other. And then, of course, the modern history of international law really started changing after 1945, after World War II, with the formation of the United Nations, which has almost all the states of the world, about 193 as members, and with two non-member observer states, the Holy See and Palestine. I, I have the state of Palestine here. That's a mistake. It's, it's not a state. It's the problem is they're under the category non-member observer states. So they're classified as a state to be a non-member observer, but they're not recognized as a state by anyone. So it's, it's an odd situation. Um, so you have countries that don't recognize Palestine that vote for them to be admitted as a non-member observer state, even though they're not a state. And I've, I've pointed out before in blogs, like on Lou Rockwell's blog years ago, uh, you, know, you could say that the Holy See nowadays, the, the Catholic Church, is maybe one example of a, of a voluntary state. It's got roughly a billion citizens, the Catholics around the world, who give voluntary contributions. It doesn't have taxes, doesn't have an army. So it's really maybe one of the best states in the world. Um, some people in Pennsylvania might disagree right now. Though. So one of the concepts that's important for the modern notion of international law is that the state is regarded as having sovereignty. Okay. This basically means territorial sovereignty. So the other states uh, agree to recognize uh, the independence of those states. Um, and of course this concept, uh, it traces back in political theory to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which ended the Thirty Years' War. Um, some people think that having obligations on states as sovereigns is inconsistent with their ability to be, uh, to be sovereign. 
but um, that, that issue has pretty much been settled by now, and uh, international law is regarded as a real body of law that does govern what states can do. Um, there's a, a well-known treaty from 1933, the Montevideo Convention on Statehood, and it defines what states are, how we recognize what a, when there is a state. So it has four criteria. You have to have a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and the capacity to enter into relations with other states. That's a little bit circular, um, and it has to do with the idea of recognition, one state recognizing the other. But um, this is one reason why you can have microstates, like some of the very tiny states, like the Holy See. Um, uh, now, there is something about recognition. So recognition is regarded as a political fact. That is, the state either does exist or it doesn't exist as a political fact if it fulfills this criteria whether or not other states have officially recognized that state. So, um, um, which, which is one reason why you have the, the odd issue of the Palestine situation. They're not recognized, but they're admitted into the UN. Um, uh, and the, the same treaties and international law rules govern the issue of succession of states. States change over time, and this political reality has to be recognized. Uh, otherwise, the world would be ossified into one a system that, that didn't conform to reality. So f a good example would be the USSR. When the USSR collapsed um, in 91, I believe, um, and Russia, Russia assumed the seat of the USSR on the U United States, uh, I mean, the, on the UN uh, Permanent Security Council, for example, um, and is recognized as the successor in obligations under international law and treaties to what USSR had agreed to before. So there's, a, there's an interesting uh, part of international law dealing with how to recognize when states are successor states. Um, now, the definition of a state by international law is not the same as the political theory definition we would have as libertarians. For example, Hoppe, um, following others like Rothbard and Nock and um, these thinkers, we, we would define the state, uh, if you look at the bottom definition, uh, having two features two characteristics, a compulsory territorial monopolist of ultimate decision making, that's its jurisdiction, and then it's a territorial monopolist of taxation too. But um, this definition, which I think is essentialist and correct, is, is not incompatible with the way international law looks at it. And it's, it's hard to imagine a state that um, the libertarian definition would recognize as a state and that international law wouldn't. They're, 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 they're pretty uh, synonymous uh, uh, definitions or classifications. Now, how do we know what international law is? How do we know what its concrete particular rules are? Um, so the International Court of Justice, which is the, the chief uh, court of the U United Nations, uh, in their statute, it, there's a definition of, of how they determine what the law is. Okay? So it's got four, four functions. Number one, international conventions, which are like treaties. International custom, okay, which is evidence that nations have accepted this. Now, these first two, if you think about it, are consensual because the first is what nations have consensually agreed to. That's what a treaty is. It's explicitly agreed to and it's in writing. And custom is what states implicitly agree to by, the, by their conduct. And then you have the general principles of law recognized by nations. And how do you figure this out? Well, you can look and you can see what their municipal law is, what the actual law of England is, what the actual law of Argentina is. And to the extent that those start uh, representing a common type of a legal principle, that would count too. Um, and that is non-consensual, if you think about it, because uh, the states as actors on the international scene will have that third source of law applied to them under international law, even if they didn't make that law themselves. And then finally, fourth, uh, uh, judicial decisions, that's like court decisions in different countries, and the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists, that is scholars, thinkers, Right, so what's interesting is that um, one of the main sources of international law could be resort to reason and uh, natural law principles even given by, uh, by, by theorists uh, because it's not a legislation-based system. Now, compare this to municipal law, the laws of countries, and let's just take the two great systems of the, of the world today. Um, uh, the common law, the English common law, uh, which is uh, uh, and and the civil law, the European continental law. 
So in the common law, the, the source of law used to be the courts, court decisions, right? Judges trying to do fairness or equity in a given case, trying to reach a fair result, and relying upon precedent. Nowadays, uh, there's more and more legislation in common law countries like the US and even England, um, uniform commercial code and uh, tons of special legislation. So the court system has been watered down by legislation. Uh, so legislation is now a, a big source of law, even in the common law countries. And in the civil law, the civil codes were originally the basis of their law, and the codes were codifications of principles developed in Rome and in Europe uh, through custom. Uh, and and the, the, the Roman law was developed largely in a decentralized system similar to the common law, actually, by, by decentralized fact-finding uh, sort of courts. Um, but they were legislatively codified. So the legislature had some legal experts codify the law, and then the legislature passed it as the law. So it's, there's a certain legal positivistic aspect to it. And of course, the civil codes have been now uh, swamped um, uh, by other special legislation. So the point is, in most municipal law systems, common law and civil law, legislation is the key or a key source of law. Um, although I have quoted here, I forgot to mention these, these four articles. This is the first four articles of the Louisiana Civil Code, where, where the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, and the first one says, the sources of law are legislation and custom. So at least they recognize custom as one source of law, but still legislation is primary. Um, now, in, in international law, like I mentioned, you can have natural law introduced into the argument about what the law should be. Um, because as I mentioned, the treaties and, 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 the, and custom are based upon consent, consent by countries, and the non-consensual sources can include the opinions of, of specialists, jurists, philosophers, basically legal philosophers. So there's basically more room to argue for a just result in international law because you're not just arguing what the law, what, what the legislation is. So one example would be, and this is something I cover a lot in, that, in my book that I had written on private international law, um, there was a wave of the uh, expropriations and nationalizations of uh, Western um, oil companies and uh, uh, a property in, in the Middle East in the 70s, right, leading to the oil crisis and, um, and that. And so there was lots of international arbitrations and lawsuits by these, the companies that had been victimized, um, Texaco, et cetera, and before international arbitral tribunals arguing that they should be compensated. Right. And so the, the, the question was, well, I mean, what, what did, what did, the, what did, what did the, the, uh, the host countries argue? They, well, first, some of them didn't show up. They said, I, we don't recognize the, the legitimacy of the tribunal. We don't have to recognize it. Um, we're a sovereign country. These are just companies. They're not even on the international scene. Uh, and then, then they would argue, um, uh, we don't have to owe, pay full compensation. And then there's a, this is a technical thing, lucrum sesens or damnum emergens, like the, the damages that come just about from the taking, or do you have to take into account lost profits for the future, which would be more like the full value. Um, and over time, uh, it's pretty much been settled in international law now that, the, of course, you have to pay compensation, and it has to be full compensation um, because of the reasoning of the, uh, of, of the people advocating for that. Uh, they didn't have to appeal to, a, to a, a statute that already settled the issue. They could appeal to common sense and reason and fairness and justice and natural law. Uh, this is some quote that I love. Uh, I've quoted this before here. Uh, in, in 1884, there was an effort to codify the, the common law of New York. And one of the defenders of New York common law uh, argued vigorously against it. He, he won. It wasn't codified legislatively. And uh, he's got this great quote when he, he talks about how hard, uh, the good thing about a, a common law system, one that can be based upon custom and, and, the, and, and the, the appeal to reason. Um, okay, he says, at present when any doubt arises in any particular case as to what the true rule of the unwritten law is, it is assumed that the rule most in accordance with justice and sound policy is the one which must be declared to be the law. The search is for that rule. The appeal is squarely made to the highest considerations of morality and justice. These are the rallying points of the struggle. The contention is ennobling and beneficial to the advocates, to the judges, the parties, to the auditors, and then to the whole community. The decision made records another step in the advance of human reason toward the perfection after which it forever aspires. 
But when the law is conceded to be written down in a statute, and the only question is what the statute means, a contention unspeakably inferior is substituted. The dispute is now about words. The question of what is right or wrong, just or unjust, is simply irrelevant and out of place. The only question is what has been written. What a wretched exchange for the manly encounter upon the elevated plane of principle. Um, so this guy was great. Uh, and anyway, you can see that the, the, the international law is more like the spirit of this original common law than the appeal to statutes. So that is one, um, one appeal of international law. Hans, how much time do I have? Okay. So this is sort of a grab bag uh, speech I'm giving here because I'm taking different topics because international law is a vast, vast field. You can't cover it comprehensively. Um, it, these are some of the areas that concern international law or that are the laws of war is one big issue and the law of treaties because these are two of the biggest ways that uh, things that international law governs, right? How treaties are formed. Now, tr the treaties are thought to be binding because of the idea, it's a Latin term, pacta sunt servanda, agreements are to be respected. Now we have the United Nations, which is not to be confused with international law. Um, of course, it plays a big role now in international law, but it doesn't make international law, and uh, it is distinct from international law. Um, there's a political science field of international relations. There's the International Court of Justice. Then there are things called international organizations which have legal personality under international law and thus can be subjects of international law like the, the UN itself, the European Union, NATO. There is an international criminal court. The US <laughs> refuses to be a member, I wonder why. Um, there's growing field of international human rights and humanitarian law, environmental law. And then there's also private international law, which I mentioned, and a whole field of international arbitration where these large companies engage uh, large law firms to sue countries in Switzerland or, or America or some, some neutral place. Um, a couple of things that I find interesting in international law, I'm just gonna touch on them here. There's something called the act of state doctrine and the related idea of sovereign immunity. This is not a universal law, a rule of international law, but it is, uh, the act of state doctrine is recognized in English and in US law. And it's sort of the idea, and this is based upon this idea of state sovereignty that uh, uh, one state's courts will not sit in judgment of the acts done by another government on their own soil. It's sort of not respecting their sovereignty. Okay, so, and usually this doctrine is invoked when there's an expropriation of the government, of, of the property of, of a national of another state. Um, and uh, in the US, for example, one reason, uh, the, the government doesn't want people to be able to sue the, 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 the offending state in their courts. They want it to go to the, through, the, through the president's office, through the executive branch, so it can be handled politically. And it's called the Foreign Act of State Doctrine in, in England. Okay, now, um, I'll skip this case. There's a couple of key cases that define this, the Underhill versus Fernandez, um, where uh, there was a, uh, an American citizen named Underhill in Venezuela, and after the revolution, um, he was running this waterworks system in Cuidad Bolivar, and the general denied him a passport so he'd stay there and run the waterwork system for a long time. Finally, when he got home, he sued for being detained uh, in American courts, and he lost because the U.S. court said, we, we can't judge the actions of the Venezuelan court. And there was a similar case when the Cubans uh, nationalized uh, American sugar uh, industries uh, uh, plants, and, um, and the plaintiffs lost there too because even though what Cuba did was illegal under international law, illegal because they didn't pay compensation. Right, you can expropriate property, but it has to be with due process and it has to have compensation, and it didn't have that. Uh, so those are two examples. And there's a related doctrine called the foreign uh, sovereign immunity or foreign sovereign immunity, and it was codified in the U.S. in '76, uh, and it, it it limits when a foreign government can even be sued in a U.S. court. So it's a jurisdictional issue. And there's an important exception, the commercial activity exception. So when a foreign government acts the way that private companies act, um, then they can be sued. And one example would be when Argentina defaulted on their bond payments. They, 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 could be, they, they said that you can't sue us because we're a sovereign. And um, the court held that, no, you're, you're engaging in a financial tr activity just like a, a, a creditor would or, or a borrower would. And there's one exception. In 2016, in, in the aftermath of, of um, I guess, 9-11, the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act. So an American citizen can sue foreign countries in U.S. courts 
uh, based upon damage from a terrorist act committed on U.S. soil. So there is an exception there, there too now. Um, now, one criticism of international law, even by some libertarians, is, the, is a sort of a, a, a criticism based upon the idea of legal positivism. People will say international law isn't real because there's no, there's no one world government cop to enforce it and there's no statutes to enforce the law. But that critique is uh, similar to the mainstream critique of our anarchist, our libertarian idea of anarchy, right? I mean, we, we believe you can have law without a, a sovereign state over us. Um, and so I think this critique is, is flawed, and libertarians especially shouldn't, shouldn't make it. Now, there, is, there has been for a long time a hostility towards not so much to international law, uh, uh, except how the West and the U.S. have manipulated it for their, for their benefit, but to the United Nations itself. You know, you, you've seen these bumper stickers, or I used to see them, get the U.S. out of the U.N. or get the U.N. out of the U.S., um, Joseph Stromberg has some good articles on this, actually. Uh, one, of, one of our old uh, Mises Institute friends. And uh, he said, I understand that sentiment, but as a libertarian friend of mine said around 1971, the UN may indeed be a mere debating society, but if nations are debating, at least they're not shooting. So, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world when nations talk with each other instead of having war. So I wouldn't say the UN has done um, a lot of good, but it's not the worst danger there is. And international law certainly is not something we should. Um... Now, there was an interesting issue in the US. Um, the, the US has a, a strange clause in the Constitution. It's called the Supremacy Clause. And what it, it says the, the, the Constitution and federal law is the supreme law of the land. Um, but it also says, and treaties made to it. So there, there was a concern for quite a while that uh, the, the president could basically do an executive agreement, which is like a treaty under international law. And, and basically circumvent the Constitution by, or, or, or the Congress could do it with, a, with, a, uh, with, a, with an authorized treaty, a ratified treaty. So there was a concern that like the Bill of Rights could be o overturned by a, just a treaty with, with another country. So Senator Bricker tried to get this amendment, which, which uh, was going to pass. In 1952, it would, it, would, it, would have, it would have amended the US Constitution to prevent this, to make sure that treaties could never uh, conflict with the Constitution's provisions, but it lost, uh, unfortunately. Um, so we don't have that now. So th some, some people still bring that up from time to time. And I, I would be in favor of the Brooker Amendment. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll mention one more, more thing before I close. Um, there's a, a fantastic article. It's not directly related to this, but it's about this idea of anarchy, uh, which we have in the international system, right? We don't have a sovereign. Um, there's a classic article by Alfred Kuzan, who I think is not even a libertarian, but he wrote it in this 1979 issue of the JLS. It's really a classic article. It's short. If, no one's ever, if you haven't read it, you should read it. I think he wrote a follow-up about five years ago called Revisited in, the, in the, one of the last issues of the JLS. Um, but what he argued is that we don't, we don't really, the argument is a fake argument that, um, that we could ever have anarchy. You know, when people say we could never have anarchy, you have to have a government. He's saying we actually never have a government. We, we always have anarchy because the only question is what type of anarchy do we have? Do we have a, a pluralistic decentralized market anarchy, which is what we favor, or do we have like a non-market hierarchical or political anarchy, right? So when you have a state, what they do is they abolish the anarchy among their subjects, uh, but they have anarchy inside the state. And let, let me show you this figure here. This is a figure from his article. You see on the left, this is, this is natural anarchy. So all these citizens, A, B, C, and D, they have a bilateral relationships with each other. But when the government steps in, the figure on the right, the G is the government, the government forces A and B and C and D to go through it, right? This is what Hoppe means in his definition of the state as having a compulsory monopoly on jurisdiction and, and dispute settlements. But on the bottom part of the part, those are the people within the state. They're, they're not governed by something above the state because they constitute the state, and there's no super state above them. So they're in anarchy with each other. So you always have a type of anarchy. So you never get out of anarchy, really. Um, I think I'll, I'll close here. Uh, I have some more material in this, which you can read later. And if anyone is more interested in this, on the very last page, I have some list of further reading. Um, and I, what I would highly recommend for anyone interested, the top two things on here would be Rosalind Higgins' book, Problems and Process, uh, 
Um, it's really readable and it's, it's really a, a wonderful book. And then there's a great online course on YouTube. It's called the International, International Law MOOC, which I think means Massively Open Online Course. It's like a 40 part thing, five, 10 minutes each. Um, it's, it's pretty recent too, it's really good. Um, and then for more systematic treatments, I would start with Mark Janice's book. It's really a really good treatise, but that's, that's a whole legal treatise, which most of you won't wanna read. Um, all right, so I'll stop here. Thanks very much.